In our last video, we talked about serial communication from one device to another. Computer talks to modem, modem talks to computer, computer talks to printer, that kind of thing. It required a lot of setup, and unless you use some custom equipment like we do, you don't really see it much anymore. Nowadays, we have many computers all interconnected with each other through switches and routers within something called a network. This network could be something like your ship's network, which is a local area network, or something like the internet, which is essentially a network of networks. The dominant networking standard in use today is Ethernet, which is clear once you see how many Ethernet cables spill out of today's electronic racks. So let's talk a bit about Ethernet and how it works. Remember when we used to get mail all the time, like real mail and letters? Well, the postal service actually works a lot like Ethernet. First, you need to have two mailboxes, one for yourself and one for the recipients of the letter. The mailboxes have addresses with zip codes and can hold a bunch of letters. The mailman drives around all day delivering letters which have addresses and stuff on the front and the actual letter inside. Sometimes it's easy with a letter just going next door. Other times, you got to send that letter across the country or even further, which makes the delivery much more complicated. The tech savvy folks might not like me saying this, but your computer basically has a mailbox, which is the network interface card. The mailbox has an address called the IP address. It also has something like a zip code, which we call the subnet mask. We'll talk more about that later. The mailman and the roads he drives on represent the ethernet cable. When you start adding more roads, you need to add in an ethernet switch to connect all of these different mailboxes. If you try and mail a letter to someone outside of your neighborhood or city, you'll need a router, which lets you connect between networks. Those are all the basic elements. So let's dig in each one a little bit, starting with cables. It's probably just me, but I think Ethernet cables are kind of cool. If you look at coaxial cables, which are what you use when you hook up your cable TV, you can get one solid wire inside an insulator that prevents electrical interference. We actually used to run Ethernet on coax a lot at one point in time. Modern Ethernet cables have a bit more to them. They consist of four twisted pairs of wires inside a rubber sleeve. Some terms you might hear include UTP, or unshielded twisted pair, which is all of the Ethernet cables you will most likely encounter. CAT5E, which is just the cabling standard, which indicates cable quality and supported speed. And RJ45, which is just the plug type. Okay, now what about those network interface cards? Well, they plug into the PCI bus on your computer and give you an Ethernet port to use. Most of the time, you get them built into the motherboard, although if you need a bunch, you can get a separate card. One thing to notice here are these little lights above the plug. If you only have one, it generally goes solid green when your cable is connected properly. This is the link light. If you have two, you should see the link light on the top left and the activity light on the top right. The activity light will flash when there's data going across. If the link light is out, try another cable. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, IP addressing and Ethernet configuration. Compared to serial, there's actually less stuff you need to do here. First, you need to establish an address for your computer. An IP address is composed of four octets, which is just a fancy word for an 8-bit group. Remember your binary from part two of this series? Well, it just so happens that 8 bits can represent up to 255 in decimal, if you count the zero. So your total available addresses are everything from 0.0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255. So wait, if we're all connected over the internet, then what happens if we have the same IP address? Well, there are public and private IP addresses. Your internet service provider gives you a public IP address tied to your router when you sign up for their service. That IP address is the only one the world sees for your network. You might have a bunch of computers with different IP addresses using that internet service. Those computers all have private IPs issued by the router, generally starting with 192.168. So you can have all kinds of computers with all kinds of addresses, but really take up only one public IP address. Smart, huh? Okay, so how do we start assigning these IP addresses? Well, you want to have them organized in a specific way. The first two or three octets are generally the same for all of your machines. 
Those numbers are called the network prefix, since they identify the network your computers are on. This will be 192.168 for these guys. The last two octets for our computers are the host addresses. Since we have two octets for our host address, we can have 2 to the 16th, or about 65,000 addresses. What if within our 192.168 network, we want a 192.168.255 subnetwork, separate from the other networks? Well, that's where the subnet mask and our binary comes in handy. See, what we want to do is specify what the network prefix is by making our subnet mask block out all the relevant numbers with a binary 1. Kind of easier to show it than to explain it. If the blocked out numbers differ between the two IP addresses, then they're on two different subnets. If you think of the network prefix as being a mailing address with the host address as your name, the subnet mask is kind of like a zip code. You might have really similar addresses, but with different zip codes and different mail runs. Okay, maybe we should just do one. Let's say my IP address is, oh, I don't know, 10.49.33.86. Now my subnet mask is 255.255.252.0. So I can only see 10.49.32.0 to 10.49.35.255. That seems to be working out for me so far, so that's good. If I need to get to a server that has an address of 10.49.49.49, that would be tough since it's outside of my subnet. Okay. So that covers most of the configuration you'll be doing. We didn't cover DNS or DHCP, which deals with auto-assigning IP addresses and names, which most of you are probably using right now. We did, however, cover what we needed to get you going with your survey gear. Anyway, thanks for watching, and good luck out there.